Amen. This morning, we will have a reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Hear what God is saying to the people. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you. Even though my virtual background is the chapel, I wish it were the real thing. Um, it's, it's wonderful to see all of you and be together this morning on this blessed day. You know, where we are in the story at this point, it's been a couple weeks since Easter, and I don't know about you, but it feels like it's been a long time since Easter. Um, our sense of time has been so disrupted lately. Mm -hmm. We have to enter back into this, this scene and this sense of being close to the Easter time because Mary has seen the Lord, but the disciples have not yet seen him. So this is their encounter story. And remembering, too, that nothing is accidental in the Gospel of John. Everything that John writes, all of his language, everything is, is deeply symbolic and perfectly chosen. So nothing is accidental. All the words that appear are are part of the message that we receive from the writer. Now, the setting is one of lockdown and fear, which uh, is incredibly ironic since many of us feel the same way these days. But Jesus comes and is within, with them and speaks a word of peace to them. And then he shows them his wounds. So in his hands and his side, he shows them his wounds. And there is rejoicing. He sends them. He tells them that he sends them. He breathes the Holy Spirit on them. And then he speaks about forgiving sins. Then Thomas is introduced into the story. And this is where he kind of gets the bad rap of being Thomas the doubter instead of Thomas the believer, which he actually was. But Thomas is introduced that he wasn't there. So that the following week, we have a replay of the story. Again, the setting is closed doors. So they are closed inside and enclosed. And Jesus comes and speaks a word of peace. Again, he shows them his wounds. And he says to Thomas, touch me. So there's an invitation for a physical touch of his hands or his side. And then we have Thomas's confession, my Lord and my God. It's clear that Jesus's wounds matter in this text. 
and with John, again, nothing being accidental, we know that the focus on the wounds is important to the writer of the gospel. They show up also in the Gospel of Matthew, although not in the same way as they do in John, so it's clearly important to John, that the crucifixion and the resurrection be completely entwined here in Jesus' body. Both are present, the crucifixion and the resurrection. His body is evidence of both. The wounds matter. The wounds are not overcome in the resurrection, which is interesting, right? Even though we claim no resuscitation of a corpse, we say that the resurrection of Jesus is something different. He is transformed in the resurrection. His wounds remain. His wounds remain. They're clearly important. In fact, Christ is not Christ without the wounds of Christ. They are evidence of God's love, the evidence of how far God will go to love the world, and they are also evidence that betrayal, denial, rejection, all the sins that we are so good at dishing up are not the final word. Now, there's an apocryphal story about St. Martin that um, makes this point of the Gospel of John really well. And for those of you who have studied Zinzendorf, Zinzendorf being a um, theologian of this area, actually, he was here and in Lidditz and so forth, and he was very much into the wounds of Christ. And he tells a story about St. Martin. And he says that St. Martin was walking when Jesus appeared to him. It was actually Satan, but he was in the appearance of Jesus, in the likeness of the Savior, but in the form of a majestic king surrounded with heavenly glory. He said to him, Martin, you see how I love you. And what an important servant I consider you, for I personally appear to you rather than other men. Martin is said to have answered, if you are Christ, where are your wounds? The reply was that he did not come to him as one wounded, as one from the cross, but rather he came from heaven. He wanted to show himself in his glory as he sits at the right hand of his father. To this, Martin answered, you are the devil, a savior who is without wounds, who does not have the mark of his sufferings, I do not acknowledge. So the wounds matter. What's ironic is that John Calvin, another theologian that you've probably heard of, felt that the wounds eventually disappeared, that the idea that the risen Christ maintained his wounds was actually kind of absurd. Uh, which is very interesting. We'll come back to that later on. So John's emphasis on the wounds of Christ pushed me to think about our own wounds as disciples, especially those of us who either already do or plan to serve in the church. What happens to our wounds in our new life, this post-resurrection life that we claim that we live in, and we claim that we are a new creation in? Wounds inflicted by others upon us, wounds inflicted by ourselves on ourselves. While there is healing for us in Christ, our wounds remain, as do those of Christ. The question then becomes, can our wounds become evidence of love? Can they further the healing word we offer to others in our discipleship? Now, I know they can. And I know that many of you know they can. They can be a path to greater empathy, compassion, deeper engagement, and authenticity. However, I also know how we can become stuck in the cul-de-sacs of our own wounds. Some of you know this as well. Depending on where we are in our own healing, they can consume us. I know this. I've been there. Just one example, in the midst of my divorce, I was so wounded that I couldn't be empathetic to anyone else. Pain is, after all, very selfish. It is. And I was so wounded that I was bleeding all over other people. Either bleeding all over them 
or hiding from them behind locked doors, right? And in my woundedness, I bled all over people in a variety of ways. Bitterness, resentment, claiming to be the victim. What I did was I pointed to my own wounds. But the truth is I was unable to minister effectively. And I was a very poor disciple because I could not set myself aside. God held me in that time, and that was crucial for my healing. But I learned also that wounds that are untreated don't heal. Treatments like discernment and spiritual direction and therapy and medication, prayer, forgiveness, release. After all, the unhealed minister is a dangerous thing to the church and to herself. The transformation that comes through new life in Christ, the moment that we each have, like Thomas, when we say at some point in our lives, my Lord and my God is life changing. The starting place perhaps for our own healing. But remember that the other experience of the disciples in this passage is being sent. Jesus sends them out into the midst of suffering and fear and death, past all of the locked doors. All those locked doors then, all these locked doors now. If our wounds have not found at least partial healing, we cannot be well sent. If our own wounds consume us, we will not be able to see those of others. If we are consumed by bitterness and resentment, there is no room for love and for empathy. If we have not heard or experienced the words of Jesus, peace be with you. In our own hearts, we cannot speak or bring peace to the world we are sent to. Know that like Jesus, we remain wounded. As much as we might like to go with John Calvin's version <laughs> and say that once I become a disciple, all of my wounds disappear, it's not what happens. Our wounds are transformed in Christ, but they remain. Many of you know how to live or learn to live with scar tissue, right? We don't know how to live with that. And when our wounds are understood by us and we have come to know the forgiveness of which Jesus speaks, which interestingly enough is one of the very first things he says to the disciples, he speaks of the forgiveness and the love of God for this wounded world. When we know that in our hearts, we are enabled to enter the pain of others. We become the companions to the wounded. We become able to point to Jesus's wounds as evidence of love. And in so doing, we become the orderlies of the great physician. Amen. <laughs>